Hi everybody, um, this is Ben Atkinson from LinkedIn and welcome to our interview series, Inspiring Leadership. And this week's theme is taking everybody on the journey. And with us always is um, Jonathan Berman Perks, our leadership expert. Jonathan, who are we interviewing this week? Thank you very much, Ben. And as I say, welcome to my favorite time of the week. And we're very lucky to have Paul Cooper. Now, Paul was recommended by another of our favorites, Philippa Snare who's a Microsoft background, but she's now the Senior Vice President uh, for EMEA for Trade Desk. And Philippa said, you've got to get Paul Cooper on. He's a fascinating guy. He's an entrepreneur, a board director, an investor. He was the founding partner of Clarity, uh, which towards uh, the end of his time before he's moved on to other things, two billion plus of M&A advisory work. He's built a business uh, and he's gone through the financials. I love this one gone through the finances of a thousand management teams, seeing the patterns and what goes on, which for Ben, you and I, this is fascinating. So Paul, welcome. Great to have you on the series. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me both. Yeah, well, it's, it's great. And, and it does work as I know you've got a number of people you think are inspiring leaders that you'd like on the series. And, and it's great that you've listened to so many of them. So you know some of the conversations that we've had. And while we've had a number of military people, we want more diversity and more inclusion with a whole variety of different businesses. And, and you've got a few people already that you've been suggesting. Let's, um, talking about you, I'm really interested about your current, this current stage you're at right now and in the next uh, stage you've got going on, but particularly your career journey into leadership. Give us, give us a bit of a flavor. Right, so I suppose um, up until very recently, as you mentioned, I was a partner at um, Clarity, so an advisory firm. Um, and we advised across the media and technology companies. Um, and I took a career break in 2019, went traveling, um, which has been wonderful. Um, and, um, you know, through COVID times more recently, helping, you know, friends and companies and contacts uh, just help them make the difficult decisions that they're having to having to work through. But if you sort of wind back, what, what got me, what, what, what really got me going in the early days was mum and dad set up a, a biotech company um, in you know when I was a teenager and I found it absolutely fascinating watching the process of building business plans, getting money in, um, you know, to, sort of the, the successes and failures, um, then getting the recognition for the successes, raising more money, growing, um, and ultimately selling the business. Um, you know, when I was at university, and um, that that really influenced me. I, that sort of you know watching the, the successes and failures there, and you know they did wonderfully well. They got you know Queen's Awards for export and innovation, and uh, that was great. And 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 so I. In the process of doing an electronics degree, I then went off to KPMG. I thought I need to learn more about business um, and started auditing um, and doing advisory work uh, there. Then I went off to uh, Casano, uh, now part of JP Morgan, and I worked in the during the sort of dot com period doing IPOs and floating businesses. So again, seeing more businesses um, and um, you know, and then sort of in the early noughties, I, I founded Clarity in London, uh, which we grew. Um, and then we partnered into the US with um, a wonderful lady called Wilma Jordan, who was inspirational um, and formed the JGI Clarity platform. Um, and but I think those early days, you know, spending time, you know, listening and helping out um, in, in mum and dad's business was really inspirational. And sorry, with Clarity, what was the, what was the the, the platform there? So we um, ended up with four offices um, in London, New York, Boston, and Sydney, um, and um, advising media and technology businesses up to about $500 million in value. Um, and I left the business at the back end of 2018. Um, mm. And uh, the business has continued to strength from strength to strength without me, which is absolutely fantastic. I think that's a, <laughs> the sign of a um, you know, I founded the London office 17 years ago now, um, and yeah. it's still going strong. Um, you know, years after I've left, and that, that to me is uh, you know sign of success when you can engineer your own obsolescence. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been tough to to give it up though to to, to leave at, at some point after building something like that. I think, yeah, I, yes, possibly. Um, although I needed new challenges, I think you know. Mm. I, so I miss the people. Um, and I miss the clients, mm. um, but 
you know, you, I think you need to keep learning something every day. Um, and as soon as you are starting to go through the motions and you've got people below you who are, you know, becoming better than you at something, it's time to get out of the way and make, make space. And, yeah. um, and that's what I did. And, you know, my seat was filled by the two guys behind me. And, um, you know, they, they're almost certainly doing a better job than I would because they are energetic about it. And, and I yeah. think that's yeah. a key thing is in leadership is to know when it's somebody else's turn. Yeah, yeah. And you must have learned so much from from your parents in those sort of formative years. But is there sort of a, a piece of advice you wish you had when you first started out and, and, and could, uh, uh, could have changed? Yeah, it I think it's probably a lot of them. But there's, there's one that jumps out, um, uh, jumps into mind. And that was I was having breakfast. So um, uh, one of my, my two, I had two wonderful partners during the sort of key growth period, a chap called Ben Tolley, another chap called Marcus Anselm. And um, Ben and I were having breakfast with uh, an amazing chap who was, um, uh, he was our accountant. And, um, uh, and and we were sat there and we were stressing about this new hire that we wanted to make. It was going to be super expensive. And, um, and and he just said, calm down, you know, kind of, you know, you, you know, what's he going to cost? No, and we started talking about his annual salary, his bonus aspirations, and, you know, it's in there, calm, calm down, calm down. What's he going to cost this month? Okay, what's he going to cost next month? What's he going to cost the month after? Okay, at what point on this journey do you start making more revenue than he's costing you? Three, four, five, six months? Mm. Okay, so why are you worrying about the whole year's cost? You know, if this is going to work, if you've hired the right person, then it'll work. You know, you only need to make sure that you can fund the, the, the near-term investment. And and I think what it taught me was to keep things in perspective because so often you can, you know, you're in the fight, you just lose the objectivity and mm. and, and his just sort of very calm external view. And I wish I would had that advice earlier because we would have grown a lot faster, a lot quicker, um, you know, because we're just too conservative. Um, right. That's a really good point. And... A number of the things have triggered for me, Paul. One is that uh, a number of leaders and CEOs said that um, they either wanted to be the biggest dog <laughs> on the team, and so they hired dwarfs, people who were metaphoric metaphorically smaller than them, mm. and they were frustrated they weren't good enough and they couldn't grow. Um, others who took a took a, a real gamble, and but they hired they did the due diligence, but people who were bigger than them. Uh, and they always generally did well. Philip has done that, uh, and she's she's a very talented person. We'll have her on next week, Philippa Snare. But um, the other thing was the good leaders would make themselves, as you did, redundant. So they, they delegated and handed over more and more and more until at the end, they had so much free time. And, and one of the early people um, who was the CEO of the Crown Estate, Alison Nimmo, who was a very... Hmm. You, you know her, I can see you nodding. Uh, Alison remembered with pride when she stopped doing all the stuff on the dance floor and got onto the balcony, and she had more time to think about the three things she's paid yeah. to make a decision a year. So uh, you, you really, it's really resonated for me what you've been saying already. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, you know, people have this, this um, lovely book called Life is in the Transitions, and you've had lots of transitions, lots of changes gone on. Um, as, as you look at that, because it's not a linear career, I've, I know very few people have from, you know, school, university, first job, get married, you know, next job, die. Um, it, it's much more all over the place. Um, and, and particularly actually at my, uh, my mother-in-law funeral yesterday, you realise the life she'd had, but also she, she died quite young. She'd had some, some highs and some lows, but it brings it home. And I just think about for you, what's been some of the darkest moments in your career uh, where you've learned something, a transition point, which was really tough, and maybe some of the proudest moments. Do you want to talk about some of those, those transition points and the learning for you and for others listening um, about those transitions? So probably the darkest. I mean, it's quite interesting. You said, I think, I think to some to some extent, you quarterize the darkest moments, don't you? But because um, you have to to be able to sort of keep being sort of functioning. Um, uh, my uh, amazing wife, Kate, reminded me recently, um, post Lehman's, um, 
you know, we, she, she, she was managing the sort of utility bills at home and when we were paying them to make sure that we could pay the salaries in the office. Um, and I think that's quite a, you know, people often point at entrepreneurs who've made lots of money and go, you know, you're making lots of money, it's really inappropriate. But I think quite often they forget or don't understand, you know, the risks they take. And secondly, I think, you know, for, to be really effective in leadership, you need to be supported well at home. Um, and, you know, having that strong team um, back in the base um, meant that I was able with confidence to go out and make the decisions and, and, and you know, get the people in and win the work we needed to win. And um, so I'm sort of very grateful for the support that I had there. And, and, but there were some dark bits in it because you, you place bets and, you know, they either come off or they don't. Um, on the, the, the proudest moments, well, I mean, it has to be back to the people, you know, we sort of talked about making yourself redundant. The, um, I were, I've been lucky, you know, we hired amazing people consistently and there's, there's, there's too many to sort of, you know, list them all. But there's one very recent towards the end of uh, my time when I um, watched uh, a chap we hired um, called Jonathan Davis, who's a partner at Clarity, um, advising um, two entrepreneurs and the broader team, a chap called Victor and Wesley of, uh, of Media Monks, on the sale to um, Sir Martin Sorrell. And watching him advise this team in again, you know, with the, you know, kind of negotiating with uh, Sir Martin and um, realizing that I'd contributed to creating this environment and platform where not only could he win this work, he could deliver this fantastic outcome for our client. Um, you know, it was a real feeling of you know, tick made it. You know, that's 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 a great result. Um, but you know. Most of the people that we hired uh, will, you know, develop and grow on and do amazing things. And and I think you've got to keep hiring. You know, you you, you said it, Jonathan. I I've always felt you have to hire the people that sort of basically push you out the way, but know when to come and ask you for your advice. You know, I'm not interested in top down leadership. I've always felt that, you know, really you've got two ears and one mouth. You listen lots, um, and then you help people facilitate people making the best decision and then you back each other um to, to deliver it yeah and it, and it really sort of gives people a little bit of um accountability as well because they're not being told what to do they're deciding what to do and they, they make those sort of decisions and actions and almost sign themselves up for that so they feel like they've got a a, a part of and a purpose within within shared the purpose shared yeah. purpose totally totally right and it's it's so um having that that feeling of owning the purpose um and um and then being able to determine your contribution to it um and you know we got it wrong again and again and again but you know kind of um at least you know at least having wanting to be better at it is good um and um you know the best bits is where i've been taken aside by members of the team and said you know i'm really sorry but I don't think you handle that right. Yeah, yeah. And you know you've got the right culture when somebody feels confident enough to quietly coach you on how to be a better leader or how to help them be better at their role. Yeah. And I just think that's just such a, you know, that's that's liberating actually. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, they care. They care enough to make you better at your role so you can support them in their role. And that that's wonderful. That was yeah. really a very special time. Yeah. So how did you actually sort of make the culture and purpose come to life within your organization? Um, it took time, actually. I mean, it, it helped. So back to, you know, my two partners during the growth time. Um, uh, in fact, I think you, um, one of your colleagues um, talked about cognitively diverse Jonathan, I don't know which of your one of your speakers mentioned cognitively diverse, and it really that really resonated because Ben, Marcus, and I were, you know, we have shared value set um, and um, you know strong set of values, but um, but but we approached problems and saw situations very differently, and so it meant that we were able to support each other 
but also iterate to find best answers. And so I think I think it, it must have come from us, at least in part. And then you start hiring people who, you know, your best guests have the same values that you have. Um, and in corporate finance, that's hard, right? Corporate finance is, you know, is a subset of investment banking. Um, it's notoriously top down, um, aggressive, egotistical, and unpleasant. Uh, they burn juniors on a six to 12 month basis. Look, you know, we had our collateral damage, you know, people you know, either could or couldn't, uh, didn't want to, um, you know, take part in the sort of the pace of the job. But we were trying to create something that, um, you know, put values right at the center of what we we're doing. Um, mm. So it must have come from us. Um, and then, you know, we we ran off-site workshops around values and, and um, getting people to actually help write the values. And then we put the values on the wall and we made big efforts to live by those values. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, it, sometimes it worked and sometimes we had to work harder. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something that we've at LinkedIn done, done really well, I think. That, and there's a great video if you if you get the chance to watch um, a, a a session which um, Jeff Weiner did at Stanford Uni University with um, Reid Hoffman, um, our the LinkedIn one of LinkedIn's founders. He interviewed Jeff, um, the the previous CEO, um, about what he did to create um, that sort of culture and values in the first first sort of hundred days and. Uh, and and yeah, his sort of process of doing that and 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 really sort of digging into the business where they had this amazing culture and values, but they've never actually sat down and talked about it. They've never actually sort of written it down and said, actually, this is how we make decisions. This is how we should show up. This is how we should um, treat our customers. And and just that process of actually codifying it is 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 really quite um, liberating and bring brings it sort of to life. Um, so I, actually, I actually sat next to Reid Hoffman at a hmm. Reuters Capital event in 2000, which was just before he launched LinkedIn. Oh, really? Um, wow. It was an event run by John Taysom and the guys at um, RBC. And um, I remember saying to him, so, so, you know, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm working on a new startup. It's going to be really great. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, I can't tell you, can't tell you, can't tell you. <laughs> and, when, uh, and when I eventually got onto LinkedIn, oh, I'll ping Reid, you know, and, he, and you know, he sort of engaged, connected, and then, Obviously, you know, his business sort of went like this and, and mine grew by, you know, one person a year. <laughs> and, um, you know, I suspect he wouldn't know me from Adam now. But I do remember it was, a, it was quite a, it was, it was quite a, you know, kind of, it, it, it means a lot to me just having sat next to him and then watched how yeah. the business had grown. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think you've got to be brave with these things. Um, and, um, but oh, yeah, God, impressive. Yeah. I mean, what yeah. they've achieved, I mean, it's fantastic. But yeah. then, you know, you compare it at the same time, um, Google uh, started um, commercializing the business. It was a couple of years later in terms of starting, but but started commercializing about that sort of time. Yeah. And last time I was out um, in LinkedIn's offices, you know, you sort of drive past Google office, Google office, Google office, Google office, uh, to the little island in the middle, which is the last remaining that's refused to sell to Google. Um, and LinkedIn's in the middle of it going, Woo! <laughs> which I always quite like the irreverence of that. that yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, um, so Reed's got a great podcast. I don't know if, if, if you've um, listened to it. It's all about blitz scaling. Yeah. Um, so it's his sort of th um, theory of how to scale a business in, at, at warp speed, basically, and, and how these, yeah. these sort of tech companies um, grow while absolutely burning through cash. But it's about t basically a land grab of, of, of winning that that part of the market. Um, and yeah. He interviews different um, different tech leaders. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Um, so on to to um, how you've been sort of successful. So so looking at, um, at the professionals we we interview, um, it, it's quite obvious that that a lot of them have sort of consistent habits that they sort of live their life by, which have actually led to them being 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 successful. Um, and we we sort of talk about what what's made you sort of healthy, wealthy, and wise across across um, across your career. So it'd be great to sort of hear your thoughts about that. So um, I was reminded actually. I saw. Um, there's a lovely um, Liz and Molly cartoon um, on LinkedIn the other day, which um, a wonderful coach, friend of mine, a chap called Mike Pegg, um, 
had reshared and um, it absolutely nailed my learning experience on the healthy one, which was um, it's basically starts off with what I thought would make me productive. And it's just a round uh, Venn diagram with hard work in the middle. <laughs> and, and that was me until I got close to 40, where basically my conclusion was it's just put the hours in, you know, and if you can stay awake, you work, you'll get there sort of thing. And then um, what I have realized, and the journey is quite fun, but what I've realized that actually what actually makes me productive is hard work, time off, sleep, eating healthily and exercise. But I sort of had to, I didn't have Jonathan's military um, sort of experience. And so I haven't, I was never, I wasn't taught that, you know, I went to a comprehensive school in North Cornwall and, you know, kind of, um, so I've learned it. And um, I was, I knackered my leg in a, a sailing, I was sailing a dinghy and smacked it. And um, I went to see this wonderful physio um, called Hazel Amper. And, um, and, and she, she couldn't fix the problem. She said, oh, I can't fix this. You've got, you've damaged the knee. You need to go and see a surgeon or something. And I went up to see a surgeon. And she said, but you need to start building your leg muscles properly because your legs aren't pulling properly. And that's part of your problem. I said, well, what does that mean? She said, well, you need to go running. I said, I don't want to run. I'll wear my knees out. I want to be able to use my knees when I'm 65. And she said, Paul, at the rate you're going, you're not going to get to be 65. Wow. And I went, oh. And you know what? It was, it, you know, it, 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 it was one of the most useful bits of advice that I have ever been given. Um, and I spent several weeks, you know, my head in my hands, discussing with Kate, trying to work out, you know, how to unpick what that meant. And um, I realized that health is a choice and you need to make the investment in your own health if you want to be a better husband, a better father, a better leader, a better team member. Um, and you can you can be those things for longer if you invest a little bit along the way in your health. Um, and I bought some trainers um, and it took me three months um, but I started running and then I I used to cycle a lot as a, as a kid, and so I started cycling again. And then I took up swimming, and I started taking up weights, and I did my first Olympic triathlon um, uh, some probably two and a half years later, both Kate and I. So I came home with the trainers and came home a day later, and Kate went, I'm coming too. And so the pair of us run, we bike, we swim. we I now mountain bike a lot because I don't really like the traffic on the roads. Um, and um, so, and so the long and the short of it is, I now make time five or six days a week to exercise, and that manages my physical well-being. And then on the mental well-being, part of that comes from the exercise um, and realizing that you need to invest in yourself to be better at your job. Um, and then the other thing I do is I talk to people, and and I I like to help people and um, help them solve problems. I have a a, a way of looking at things that tend to ask different questions and I and I that makes me feel grateful often for what I have uh, and I think feeling grateful helps you stay grounded um, and um, so that's sort of my healthy uh, the, the wealthy bit um, and I give this to a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of um, people in life generally actually um, a lot of people spend everything they receive or the vast majority of it right you know kind of they see more money coming in each month of a, a way of buying something else and, and I try and encourage people to, uh, I won't say, but I, I, I use a, a, a rude term, but it's basically bugger off money. Um, and I encourage people to put six or 12 months of cash into a bank account. Um, and you never touch it because um, I think a lot of people in their jobs feel trapped in their jobs. And by feeling trapped, it starts to infect their perspective and how they feel about their job. And I think you, by having the money and knowing you are free to leave, right? You can choose to leave at any point. Either you made redundant, your business failed, or you walk out the door, right? By being free to leave, you're choosing to stay. By choosing to stay, you are making a commitment. By making a commitment, you engage. By engaging, you do a better job. And I, and I really, I feel that people need to feel that um, sense of being there. And actually, you know, so I know it's a bit funny sort of talking about savings to make you wealthy, but it, I, I think it, it's nice to have money, but at the end of the day, it shouldn't own you and it shouldn't be driving your decisions. Um, and then on the whys, I mean, <laughs> 
we're all still learning, aren't we? Um, I would say place your strengths, um, you know, know what you're good at and place your strengths. Uh, look after yourself, look after each other, treat others as you'd like to be treated, listen more than you speak. Um, don't fret over your mistakes, learn from them, don't make the same mistake twice. You know, those are all the sort of ones that I worry about. You know, in the early days, I worried about making the wrong decision. Actually, it's often you've just got to make a decision. And if you get it wrong, learn from it, but then don't do it again. Um, you know. Mm, lovely. Keep moving. Lovely. Uh, and and I, I love that. And I know why Philippa recommended you, because I found already there's a wealth of insights and experiences that you've shared. And therefore, it leads me on to the next question, really, which is, in your experience, Paul, what, what makes a good inspiring leader? We've been talking about inspiring leaders. And also, I'd add the caveat, a good team. Um, well, leadership, leadership is about working through others, right? So I think, um, I think a good leader understands the fact that they act through others um, and therefore, to achieve the best outcome, you look to the team to solve problems rather than looking to yourself. And, and that will make a good team because if you turn and you, you look to the team and say, okay, I've just got off the phone with a client. We've got this problem. What do we know? Is it really a problem? How do we solve it? Um, one, you'll get to a better answer faster. Um, and secondly, they're buying into this, you know, they own the client, it's their client. And so um, I, I think it's actually about understanding. It's not about you. It's about your team and you act through them. And then leadership is just about stepping up when the team needs you to step up and supporting someone when you need to support someone or getting out the bloody way when you need to get out the way. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's right. and your role changes, right? But, um, but I, think it's, I think it's about knowing you act through other people is the key bit. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And there, is there any specific leaders or teams that have really, really sort of inspired you? Um, well, I've mentioned my mum and dad, so Maggie and Tony Cooper. I think they, that was sort of right at the very beginning. I think on a day like today, you can't not say Winston Churchill, um, you know, as we're remembering the few. Um, I think I, I've always found, you know, he's a really intelligent man who can just say so few words, um, you know, and, and that ability, I think, is um, something that often people who like the sound of their own voice forget that sometimes it's better just to really think about what you're going to say um, and, and say a few words that capture everybody's imagination and buy in the sense of shared purpose. And um, so I, I like that. I think there's people who are sort of cultural leaders in some ways like um i think warren buffett um i just you know i i sort of you know the guy still leaves, lives in the house he bought in 1958 uh, despite the fact his net worth is you know over 80 billion dollars at last count <laughs> and he's already committed to giving away 99 percent of his wealth to charitable causes you know by the time he's died so you know i think it's a sort of um i think we have a problem through you know, governments have systematically failed to tax multinational companies properly. They fail to tax um, very high net worth individuals properly. Um, but I like seeing very high net worth individuals sort of helping to solve the problem by, by fixing that. Um, uh, I think, um, is it Jacinda Ardern, the New Zealand Prime Minister? I think she's inspiring. I think she's been inspiring for several years. And I think, you know, you hear her talk, she's compassionate. She's inclusive. You know, we're in a world which is suffering from a rise in nationalism. And here we've got someone who, you know, is, is just <laughs> deeply cares about all of everybody, everybody who lives there, regardless of whether they voted for her or not. Um, yeah. I like yeah. that. And then there's lots of people. I mean, my climbing teacher, Joe Dyer, um, my maths teacher, Mr. Register. You know, I mean, all of these people that I've been with, all the partners at Casano, you know, the, all of the entrepreneurs, you know, they've all given me something. Um, yeah. and so to sort of call out any one is, is maybe a little bit unfair. But um, there's, there's a great um, um, YouTube video of uh, Jacinda Arden. There's a, um, uh, a talk show host, um, Stephen Colbert, in, in um, the, the US. 
um, and he had her on on his show at, at some point, and um, and uh, she basically sort of said to him, "Look, if you if you come to New Zealand, I'll pick you up from from the airport and and show you round." And and so he he did, and he he <laughs> said, he made a little. Uh, it's a quite a short short little film of his Lovely. trip to New Zealand, and she did. She turned up in her little car, picked him up from the airport, and took a took took him around to show show him around New Zealand. And and had a uh, a barbecue in their garden, um, just uh, her and her hu husband. Um, so just that sort of um, down to earth sort of yeah. view, of, view of herself. It, it's, it's really I mean, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, it's fine. you sort of need you need some ego to be a leader, but you need to know when to turn it on and when to put it back in the box and leave it on the shelf. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's 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 it's hard because often. You know, often that means that you shouldn't be taking the praise um, because your team needs to take it. Um, or, um, you know, and it's knowing when your role is to lift people and when your role is to just calm them down a little bit. If had a success, you need to just manage the exuberance, not you know, manage that overconfidence. Um, it's interesting. It's uh, and you've triggered for me, actually, Paul, that I'm taking great solace from a lot of the stoical philosophies, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus. And one of the reading from um, the Daily Stoic, uh, Ryan Holiday, I like his his interpretation of it. He was talking about, Marcus Aurelius talking about the third thing and, and being careful of not getting caught by the third thing. The first thing is you do good because it's the right thing to do. The second thing okay. is, you may get some feedback from people, but don't be looking for that feedback. The third thing that you expect, yeah. do good, yeah. it helps other people, but don't then expect them to say, oh, you've done a great, did I do a good job? Yeah. Yeah. A great job. Well done. And I, I've been that person who was looking for the third oh. thing, and I've got to stop it. It's been, it's been the thing that's haunted me all my life, looking for appreciation. Stop it. Just do right. the right thing because it's the right thing and people will benefit. What's your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, look, we're all human, aren't we? I mean, that's part of the problem. So, um, but it's also what makes us sort of have the potential to be great. I think, look, we've all we've all done it. We've all looked for praise. Um, and I think it's about, you know, kind of, I, I think you have to get the joy and um, from doing the help. Um, and... Um, but, but, but something I, I I think is important to do if somebody does help you is to give the thanks, not yeah. over, but to give thanks. So um, I try I do try when somebody else has helped me to say thank you, um, and I try and wait a little bit of time to sort of let it think in and think about how to say thank you, and I take the time to say thank you. Um, I don't always get that right, and that, but I think to expect that from others is it's wrong because it does start you making strange decisions to end up at, at that point. Um, but look, you know, we are in human. So I think you just have to keep policing yourself, don't you? And each other and your mates. Um, and um, part of having friends and part of the problem with COVID, right, is, you know, we're having less human contact. You know, all of the things that you would normally do to help survive as a society in, a, in a, an environment like this, which is so strange, everybody needs, you know, comfort. Is you'd take a friend to the pub if they need a need a bit of a chat, or you'd go around and help them with the garden, or you'd do whatever. Um, and a lot of those things are deprived of us. Um, yeah, well, that, that's that's a really good theme because I mean, Ben and I were interested in what's been the impact of COVID on you, Kate, in your, your um, if your parents are still alive, but but you know, friends and family and and your world. How, how has it impacted you? So. Um, I mean, I was watching, I was watching the BBC News the other day, and they were interviewing these poor people who were coming back from Portugal, and they were there, you know, they they were going to have to quarantine for two weeks after their lovely holiday. Um, I thought I can't cope with this, so I flicked over to Bloomberg News, and they were talking about the seven to nine hundred million people on the planet who are going to suffer malnutrition or starvation this year as a result of disrupted food supply chains. Um, and I think it's really important to remember, um, you know, we are so privileged and, um, you know, kind of so, so in that context, um, we are all completely fine, thank you. Uh, family's completely well. I have three teenage girls 
in the house. Um, we're redecorating at the moment. So we were rammed into a reduced number of rooms, which was wonderful, as you can imagine. Um, but um, we're all well and healthy. Um, uh, my mum is is well and um, is, you know, kind of getting on and fixing a house, which is her pet project. Um, and, um, you know, so, and, and, and Kate's parents are well. So we're all really well, but I, I think it's um, part of it is, maintaining the sense of perspective um i think we are my one observation is we are all becoming more insular um and engaging less i mean i'm a an introvert anyway so i'm quite happy in my own company and pottering around you know making some furniture or something i don't or going for a mountain bike ride on my own you know i don't you know i don't perceive myself as needing other people but actually i do and i think we all do um and i think less human interaction both domestically and internationally is not good mm. yeah i'd agree and then if you look at business i mean it's quite interesting sort of you know i mean from my perspective from my role you know I, I feel quite lucky you know i'm not currently responsible for lots of people's salaries um and mortgages and stuff so you know my timing on that was fortuitous but you know kind of sometimes you get lucky sometimes you don't um and i'm you know working with a very impressive young leader um to put a funding uh, together um at the moment which has been really good fun and and i think businesses you know it's very easy you can sort of look at businesses going oh they're doing well they're not doing well but so much of business is to do with where you were when covid hit so if you have um, lots of travel clients, um, that won't have been good. But if you're exposed to online working or online gaming, you've probably done really well. Um, so I sort of feel that's a little bit, you know, it, it could have been a different type of illness that could have impacted things differently, right? So, um, or if it would, the internet had ceased to exist, then, you know, you might have been travel rather than online so so there we are so there's, there's there's a little bit of circumstances but then you if you look at the companies themselves and you think about where they are in their business plan um if you're a very large company and you're not exposed to the problem sectors you've probably got all the relationships to get the funding you need right you can tap the equities market you can raise debt so you know you'll probably be okay you might make a bit of a mess of it for a year or two but you'll be okay um if you are a smaller company but are really driving you know one of your uh, the businesses that reed hoffman was uh, in then you were talking about reed hoffman mm. talking about these very very rapid growth companies mm. and you've raised some money for a very aggressive step okay um if you're part way through that and that slows down and then that stretches you're burning the money to do the step but you don't get there so you've got two choices you either need to replan or alternatively, you're going to need to raise money because you're burning for longer, right? Mm. And those companies will probably struggle to raise money from new investors during that time. So they're probably going to have to raise money from their current investors. So it'll depend on the quality in the, of the business plan, the sectors you're exposed to, and how strong the, the, the funds are that are investing in you. So whereas, and if you're a tiny company or are just about to embark on an expansion phase, you're probably in the perfect place because you can now recalibrate your your business plan to take advantage of the current environment. Mm. Um, but you currently don't, you're not investing at the moment. So you can choose, you haven't got to deal with a legacy momentum. You can choose how to do that. So, so I think on the business side, it's quite hard to judge because it depends so much on where the business was when you come into, into the COVID time. Yeah. yeah. And just sort of looking at that from a perspective of leadership and teams, how do you, how do you think that it's um, impacted um, the way people lead and teams sort of now and, and, and into the future? Um, Jonathan, I've remembered who it was. It was Richard Fenning who mentioned the cognitively diverse. Um, so I think teams, teams that have cognitively diverse people within the team um, will be able to cope with this better because you need to, if your planning horizon was say three to five years, it's now become three to five weeks whilst we're in this holding pattern waiting for some visibility. You know, we're in this fog of, we don't know whether the economy is going to reset, is it V-shaped, is it a Nike tick, is it a, um, you know, is it just a massive recession, you know? And so, 
you know, you're, you're in this phase where you're just trying to keep the lights on and keep treading water until you know whether you should be investing or restructuring. And um, so I think teams which are able to share the load on the leadership roles uh, and um, take the time to rest in that short planning cycle and so that they just don't burn out, mm-hmm. um, you know, because I think the emotional, the, the really good leaders are going to be managing the emotional state of their team. You know, it's going to be body blow after body blow. You, every day you're losing a client, you're winning a client, you're restructuring an account, you're not, you're closing an office, you're getting rid of people, you're hiring people in a growth area. You know, there's, there's lots of change, and yet you don't really have the visibility to make big decisions yet. And, yeah. and that's yeah. emotional draining. And you can't have somebody on the front line day in, day out, and not expect them to burn out. So, so the leader will be rotating people through, you know, kind of responsibility, giving them a holiday, um, you know, and, and, and just keeping the options open. So as visibility clears, they're able to jump on a growth bandwagon or maybe look to, you know, restructure if they need to. Yeah, there's a, there's a great um, uh, book about um, creating dynamic capabilities. It's, it's a, 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 a business theory. I think it's uh, David Teese. Um, who wrote about it. It's a a strategy around um, how businesses um, uh, basically sense, seize, and reconfigure to opportunity and threat. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. this is really sort of relevant for for the situation that businesses are in in now. Although I would argue, I I completely agree, but I think Mm. the teams that will cope with that are already using that sort of management philosophy within their businesses. I think it's quite hard during a time of crisis to change your management philosophy and retrain, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I think you know you've you've either got a top-down command and control structure, or you've got an agile, flat, dynamic philosophy. Um, I'm not sure I would be crossing. I, I wouldn't. I'm not sure I'd retrain during that. Now you might be able to within sub teams um, develop some capability to make it a bit more nimble, mm-hmm. um, or use technology to improve communication for decision making. But I sort of feel, you know, I mean, the ability to completely, that's quite scary to use spare capacity to change the way you make decisions in a crisis. I think a lot of companies will come out of it and want to adopt what you've just said, Ben. I think that's what happened. Yeah. 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 And that picks up nicely on the next theme that Ben and I are interested in. Your top teams, uh, your top tips for leading in time of crisis and change. And before that, I, I was thinking of a couple of the organizations that I'm working with, who the analogy that they used, it's, they said it's like, it's like flying in a, a, a 747 aircraft. And mid-flight, we're trying to refuel from another aircraft with a big hose coming down to it. They're trying to shoot people down the chute as well to come on board while parachuting people out of the window and rebuilding the aircraft mid-flight. Everything is changing and we're still trying to deliver in the middle of it. And that's why they're finding it so difficult. And I, I think you make a very valid point that trying to change the way you do things so fundamentally in the middle of it is very hard. But some of them had to, you know, that famous classic quote that many of them say to us is that, you know, in five weeks, we had to make the, the changes that we were planning to do in five years when wham, 19th of March, it sort of hit us. Um, so what- well, I think most of those, that's digital. I think that I, I would challenge whether that's a cultural change on the way they make decisions or no. a shift to how they communicate. So I, well, I would agree. I think you're right. If you look, Jonathan, at the digitization, so this shift of, you know, using tools like this, you know, I mean, we would have sat down in a meeting room, wouldn't we, and done this um, mm-hmm. a year ago. Um, and here we are, you know, I'm in my shed and, you know, Ben's in his new attic, and and you know you've been out for your bike ride, and, and you're and you're back in your office, and 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 so the the digitization shift has been exactly as you've just described. But I think the the decisions will still be if it's a top down. You know, I make the decisions, you do what you're told. I suspect that's still happening in exactly the same way. Um, mm. the, the periods of review have shortened in all cases. You know, yeah. you can't you can't put a business plan out. Um, and expect people to work to it for the next three to five years because it's broken within a week. 
Hmm. So, you know, people are not making big investment decisions. But then, you know, we're kind of in this country, we were struggling with making big investment decisions because of the whole Brexit scenario. So we've got a lot of latent investment decisions to make. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I yeah, think I yeah. think the, the bit that worries me the most is the mental state of managers. I mean, we've, we've talked in the past John, about sort of the breathing, bleeding shock um, sort of idea where that sort of initial impact of COVID was, you know, sort of, it's a bit like a first aid situation where the first thing is to make sure the patient's alive. So, you know, people had to make emergency decisions to, you know, kind of make the business add up um, or at least make sure that they understood the immediate impact from the business. And that's, a, you know, one, one week to two months. Um, and we're now in this sort of breathe, you know, in the in the bleeding scenario where quite a lot of businesses are spending cash to stay alive. And so they're working out on a tactical basis how they can get a bit more money in for a bit more revenue from a new client or um, borrow some money from the government or get some relief somehow. And, and we're in this bleeding period where it's the objective is literally to stay alive. And then they're going to come out of it and they're either going to survive or they won't survive. And if they have survived... Uh, they're going to have to make decisions about restructuring or or renewing the growth plan. Um, but the shock that the leadership team will have suffered from having gone through was already six months. Mm. You know, it's going to be nine, 12, maybe more before we've really got good visibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. That shock, I think, on leadership teams is going to be hard because, they, you know, the world's got smaller. The red haze is there. You're fighting day to day to stay alive. And, you know, trying to go from that to then going, right, where's the opportunity? Where's the growth? Is, is quite hard. <laughs> and I think I think also that there, there's there's probably some really good examples of businesses that have of their their revenue stream just completely like disappeared. Um, mm. A good example was um, um, March, Mark Mark Hodgkinson. We interviewed from Scope, uh, yeah. the charity, and you can you yeah. imagine all their revenue streams is all about volunteers. It's all about events. It's all about people running races. It's all about um, fundraising, and just overnight, just the and revenue they just stopped. stopped closed. Yeah. So it was it was it was like you said, they, they had to digitalize all their services, but then they had to start to think about how enough we can raise any any money and what does that even yeah. what does that even yeah. look like? Yeah, so how do we survive while we're in this holding pattern? Yeah. Yeah. And then and then what are we looking for that means that we are going to break out of this mm. so that we can make a decision about the longer term? Yeah. And it's 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 and it, it'll depend on the industry, of course, and, and um, you know, some will be leaders on the way out. Um, but it's yeah, it's very, very challenging. Very yeah. challenging. You raise a, a really good point, Paul. And uh, a number of the scientists that I, I sort of know of and, and my brother's a surgeon are saying, you know, just be prepared for COVID-19 uh, and coronavirus being around for some years to come with us mm -hmm. how are you going to run things there and i'm saying to one or two clients oh well they, you know, I, i've only got you know i'll keep going you know it'll probably be about another eight months i go what if it's another five years what, <laughs> what do you mean what do you mean five, uh, like, oh. well, i would i would argue jonathan that if that's the case the visibility has cleared we now know we have to live with covid existing in the future so if you like, the problem is at the moment, we all have this hope that we're going to have a virus and that's going to turn up soon, um, or they have a hope that we'll get on top of it, right? And that's creating the uncertainty. Um, so either we do or we don't. And there's already, I've certainly read about two variants of the virus. Mm. So will a vaccine treat against both variants or are we going to have a third variant? And are those variants as strong as the first variant? And so there's lots of sort of, medical sort of outcomes here um, but at some point um, we will shift to a new modus operandi that will either be we're all vaccined up it's all good back to the races albeit with a lot of debt in the world or you know quite possibly um, this is the new status quo we have to operate like this and that's it and then but at least as we move to whatever that is hopefully it's a good outcome might not be so good we can make decisions that are are decisions for the good of the business and its its stakeholders that are more than three to five weeks, um, because that is visibility. You know, even if it's a terrible outcome, it's still visibility. <laughs> it's it's a very good point, and it's called the next normal as opposed to the new normal. Correct. Yeah. Mm. 
yeah. yeah. So, so within that, I think you probably identified a few mistakes there. But, but what other mistakes do you see sort of people make during those sort of times of crisis and change? I, I, I think that probably the whole shock of this this crisis was just how poorly people have, have done any crisis preparation um, across a lot of a lot of businesses. Yeah. Yes. Although it's hard, I, I it's very hard if you're on the outside of a business. Um, it's, it's, it's quite, I find it quite hard to, to, to judge. And I think hindsight mm. is one of those um, terrible ways to, to, you know, benchmark people, you know, it's, it's, um, oh, well, if you'd known, well, you did, you know, kind of, it doesn't really mm. work. But, but I think there are questions about what can we learn from it? Um, or putting it another way, let's find people who've done really well, um, and adapted their businesses really positively and then let's focus on learning what they've done and then let's share that so um i'll give you a great example um there's a nutrition science company uh called zoe um that's the ceo is a chap called jonathan uh, wolf who was originally a venture capitalist and then he was in ad tech and and and, and now has this nutritional um, science company and within weeks of covid coming out zoe launched a, a tracking app um, and I think they've got more than 4 million users who are logging how they're feeling um, and they're looking for symptoms, which is creating this enormous data set um, for uh, medical science to use in trying to learn more about COVID. Um, and I think that's a great example of a company very positively taking that sort of threat, turning it up the other way into an opportunity and using the assets and people they've got to really embrace that. And I think that's really impressive. And I think, so I, I think the if there's, if there's, once you've dealt with the, you know, the, the, the breathing, you know, then it's about how do I turn our current situation into an opportunity? Um, and that's back to the team, you know, the, the team have to find those opportunities and, and they might not come apart, but come up, come up yet, yeah, you know, they'll, but, but, but they will surface, there will be opportunity um, mm -hmm. and somebody will take advantage of it. Yeah. And to be, to be just like, just sort of looking at taking those opportunities, it's always a, a level of risk and, and, and can be a massive risk to, to jump at those sort of things that early how, how do you sort of view that and how do you actually sort of look at making those those sort of well, I, would, I would slightly wind back to my Ivan Sofa uh, comment about um, you know don't worry about the total cost of the project think about mm -hmm. you know what are you spending on day one because you quite often you know that the American VCs talk about failing fast don't they so yeah. so actually it's about review points if it's a really good idea why don't we try it okay let's, we're going to try this how far how long do we try it before we review whether it's working or not mm. and let's sprint at that and then review so we're not we're not going to try and second guess the outcome we're going to you know kind of work we know roughly where we want to be we're going to work out what the first step is we're going to sign off on that and we're going to sprint at that and then we'll review and then we'll decide whether to invest in the next sprint so yeah. i don't think you need to look at the total type of thing and if you've got spare resource and you you know it, 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 i think it's probably less of a of, of a risk in in a lot of cases than it feels yeah well this is this has been fabulous and we're just now to the last couple of minutes um before we we finish the, the series uh this, this series today um what, the penultimate question would be what would you like your legacy to be you know making a difference in your own lifetime uh, as opposed to my sergeant major who described me sir you're a legacy in your own lunchtime i think that was the derogatory <laughs> term he was using to abuse me um, what would you like your legacy to be in your lifetime? And how, how far, how far through the, uh, the 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 run with a rucksack were you at that point? I was yeah. I think I was not yeah, there. yeah, I can just imagine. Um, I've always liked the sort of pass it forward concept, um, and I think I always try to. I like to help people, um, and sometimes through helping them, that creates opportunity for me. But often it's just, I just help people and so you know it's sort of helping people make decisions so if people get in touch and say you know i'd like to talk to you about this you know what do you think i'll tell them what i think and i'll challenge them on it and often that helps them either come to a conclusion or make good decisions and um what i hope is as i help people in their decision making and their process and give them time freely um that when they are 
um, also approached in the future by people saying, you know, you did really well with that. Could you share, you know, could I talk to you about my plan? They will also pass that forwards. And, and so I think if we all sort of help each other, um, whether that's in personal things in their life or in, um, you know, in business or anything, um, we make the world a better place one step at a time. Um, and that's all we can really do, I think. So, yeah. so I would hope my legacy is when somebody says, um, say, oh, what do you think of Paul? Going, yeah, funny bloke, but um, he was always there to help. Um, yeah. That would be nice. That's a, a lovely one. And I remember some years ago, the, the film was called uh, Pay It Forward. And, and that yeah. if someone does a, an act of kindness to you, that um, their expectation is that you're going to pay it forward to two other people without expectation of anything back to them in return. You pay it forward to help others. And, yeah. and that was something that Philip has said about many of the compliments about you is that you do pay it forward, and um, I really commend you for that. And, and Jonathan, I'm going to add the bit at the end, which is, and don't look for the thanks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. Thank you. You've added, added to that now. I got that. That was good. I like third, that. Look for the third thing. Ben, over to you. Great. Yeah, Paul, it's been it's been fantastic talking to you. Really, really interesting. Um, I like the way I like the way you break down problems and the way you where you where you think. Um, so, it, is there any? Um, sort of a, a problem solving strategy that you you, you normally use because it, it sounds like that, that that's something that you you might have in your toolkit use these lots <laughs> i mean serious, on a serious point you know kind of normally if you don't know enough to make it make a decision yeah. Um, yeah. find somebody who does um you know kind of i i particularly in a business sense you know the, there's normally somebody who is exposed to the problem you know, and we'll have some ideas. So, you know, get the right people in the room and listen to them, mm. and then let the team, you know, facilitate the team coming up with ideas and answers and come up with a plan. So, I think problem solving is about listening. It's about, you know, kind of yes, you can have experience. I've seen lots of people get it wrong. I've seen lots of people get it right, um, and I like to draw on that. Mm. But that only means that I can ask good questions. It doesn't mean that I've got the answers. So I would say, ask, keep asking questions until you know enough to make a good decision. Hmm. There's this lovely story about Nelson Mandela talking about his father and the sort of leader he was. And he used to bring him to some of the, 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 the meetings he had. And he, he noted that he was the last person to speak. He would ask a question, let every single person in the room speak. And then he would make a make, make a decision. So, and, and I just thought that was just such a, a really sort of strong leader who doesn't sort of influence the room. They they come with an open mind and they take yeah. in all the information before before speaking. So, so finally, Paul, um, it'd be great just to get a book recommendation um, from you. Just something that's maybe been been formative or, or just something that's um, entertained you through through lockdown. So, um, I'm going to give you a science fiction book because I think. Um, so often these things, people get terribly pretentious about the latest management book they've read. Um, and I think you can explore really interesting concepts through science fiction. So uh, there's a Peter F. Hamilton book called Pandora's Star, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's there's, there's, there's actually two books, but that's the first one. Um, and um, it's about a Mars mission where this whole team, they get to Mars, um, and they're just about to land, and as they land, they get out of the ship. They're met by this slightly wacky Californian dude who has opened a wormhole to Mars and stepped out through his lab um, and sort of says hello, and they go back through the wormhole. And then you jump forward, and, and they humanity's expanded out through the galaxy um, using wormholes. And so you've got massive social change, massive economic change, massive governmental change. The whole controlling forces of the worlds have changed. Um, and you know you start coming across aliens and, and everything else. And it's what I think is interesting is it it's sort of you know we're talking about this virus which is actually an alien invasion, um, and um, it's just interesting to explore radical cultural, social, economic things through fiction mm -hmm. um, because it's actually easier to engage with than it is to try and think about it with all of our historical baggage. Um, and uh, it's a brilliant read as well. Oh, great. Well, Paul, Brilliant. thank you very much. Uh, we both really enjoyed uh, your insights, uh, the, the fun. It was that kitchen conversation that the three of us said we'd have to begin with. It was fun. <laughs> so uh, we'll come up.
and we'll have a bit more of a chat in a moment. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you both. Thanks very much.